Hi there, and welcome to Tech Tips Tuesday. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a few tips that may make your vacuum tube amplifier troubleshooting techniques just a little bit faster. So let's get started. If you're planning on working on vacuum tube gear a lot, there's a bunch of things that you can memorize to make your troubleshooting procedure quite a bit quicker. And that's what we're going to look at on the whiteboard here. The electronics industry has standardized a whole bunch of stuff with the basing of a lot of the vacuum tubes to make it a lot easier on the tech. These are all things that you can just put in your memory and then when you look at the bottom side of a chassis, you'll instantly recognize this stuff and know what to test and you know what you can avoid and things like that. If you're new to working on vacuum tube gear, you need to know the precautions and the hazards. High voltage is present all over stuff with vacuum tubes in it. Doesn't matter what it is, radios, televisions, amplifiers, test gear, it all has high voltage in it and you need to be very, very careful. If you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. All right, so let's talk about the basing diagram on say a standard octo tube like a 6L6 or 6SN7 or something like that, all right? So when you look at the bottom side of the chassis, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of pins sticking out of the bottom of the tube socket, and that's the exact way that it's shown on the data sheet. They always show it from the bottom side. And in order to count the pins correctly, you always start at the left side of the index and count clockwise. And it's just that simple. One thing that the electronics industry has made rather simple. So if you look at pin one here, the index is in a, say an octal tube, you'll notice that there's a locking pin in the center of the tube and there's a small extrusion to make sure that you can only put it in one way. The left side of that extrusion is pin one and you count around to pin eight. On a seven pin tube, this here is the opening between the two pins, all right? So you start at pin one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And it's the same thing with a nine pin tube. It's always looking at the bottom side of the socket or looking at the bottom side of the tube is how they count the pins. There's a few other standard things about amplifier tubes, say like the 6L6, 6B6, 6Y6, 6K6, 6SL7, 6SN7, all that series of tubes. They all use either pin 2 and 7 or pin 8 and pin 7 as a heater. And if the tubes are glowing on the top of the chassis, you don't need to test those because chances are it's going to be an AC heater system. And if they're glowing, why do you need to test the heater voltage anyway? So you can avoid those pins. And that's one way to speed up your troubleshooting procedure. Usually you'll find either a twisted pair of wires running to either two and seven or eight and seven, or a lot of the times they only have one wire running and one pin is grounded to the chassis, depending on the way that they do it. Heater wiring is usually either brown or green, usually. All right. When you're looking at a seven pin tube, pin three and pin four are usually always the heaters. So pin three and pin four, you want to keep that in mind. Again, some subs, uh, you know, circumstances where they are a little bit different and it depends on whether it's a military tube or something like that. But I would say the majority of all the seven pin tubes, it's pin three and pin four are the heaters. If you have a nine pin tube, like a 12 AX7, AU7, AT7, AV7, AY7, uh, it's pin four and pin five are the heaters and pin nine is the center tap for the heaters. All right. So when you're looking at the, the 12 AU7, all right, you'll see that you say it's a nine pin tube. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then this would be the opening right here. Okay. So pin four and pin five are the heaters and pin nine is the center tap. Okay. All right. So this is pin four and pin five. Okay, so how that is, is in the actual diagram, you'll see this, it'll go four and then five and then nine is usually how it is, all right? So if you wanna run these tubes here, they have uh, two separate ways of running the heaters, either at 12.6 or at 6.3 volts. So if you wanna run one of these tubes at 6.3 volts, you join pin four and pin five, and then that's one heater connection and pin nine is the other heater connection, all right? If you want to run them at 12.6 volts, you just use pin four and pin five and ignore pin nine altogether. So if you were to look at the heater diagram you for uh, 6.3 volts, you would join these two pins and you, this would be one and this would be the other. So really what you're doing is you're just paralleling the filaments inside. That's just how it works. And that's pretty standard for most vacuum tubes. So when I come back, I will talk about the actual numbering system on the tubes and how to use that to identify what you're using. This is how the numbering and lettering system works for standard vacuum tubes. So we'll take a 12AX7 for example. 
The 12 is the heater voltage. So that's the amount of volts it takes to light the cathode up orange. So it's actually 12.6, but they generalize. So AX is the factory designation letters. That's what tells us that it's different than an AU7 or an AT7 or an AV7. The number seven is the amount of useful elements inside that vacuum tube. So heaters, plates, cathodes, so on and so forth. So if we had a 6BE6, heater voltage is six volts, actually 6.3, again, they're generalizing. BE, factory designation letters, six useful elements inside. And that's how they all go. So if you had like a 50L6, it would have a 50 volt heater, and there are in some guitar amplifiers and uh, some you know series set radios and stuff like that. So, and it just goes on like that. So whenever you see this, just separate the sections and away you go. Now for tubes like 8417 or you know a numbering system like that, there is no standardized system and you do need to look up the data sheet on those. In order to troubleshoot an audio amplifier quickly, we can generalize on some voltages that are inside the amp, say at certain amplification stages. And of course, at this point here, we're using the best piece of test gear we have is our head. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate what's going to be there, and we'll compare it to other stages as we move along. So I'll give you an example here. This is just a single amplifier stage in a tube audio amplifier. All right, to keep it simple, we'll call this tube uh, a 6C4, okay? That's a, uh, a one triode in a seven pin package, all right? So this is where the signal comes in. This is where the signal is out, okay? And this is just really how simple a single triode amplifier is. And a lot of circuits are much like this in an IF amplifier. Replace this with a transformer and couple it to another stage. And, you know, this is pretty much the standard scheme for amplification right here using a triode. So we'll say this has got uh, 300 volts B+. Plus. So that's the B+, plus that's at on this point right here. We'll say uh, this is at... Uh, Oh, 90 volts here, 100K resistor, uh, 1.5K, and between 3 to 5 volts down here. And uh, we'll make these 0.1 microfarad, and this one is 470K. All right. So we'll just generalize here. So we know that whenever we're troubleshooting any kind of vacuum tube stage, we know that we're going to have a relatively high voltage on the plate. Okay, so this is the plate right here. So we can see that we have a drop from 300 volts down to 90 volts at this point here. And that's pretty standard in, you know, a stage that looks like this. So whenever you're troubleshooting stages, you want to go, okay, the plate has roughly, say, 90 or thereabout volts. The plate always has a high voltage charge on it. You want to look at the cathode right at the cathode pin and you know roughly three to five volts is pretty normal depending on the resistor it can be as high as 10 but this is 1.5 k ohm and we're using a 6c4 so i say three to five volts would be fine 470 k is a standard uh, a resistor that runs on the grid the reason that they have a 1.5 k resistor on the cathode is to lift the tube above ground to apply bias to the grid to shut the tube off so but at any rate these are the kind of voltages that we're going to want to look here. So we're going to see pretty much for nil, if we read from ground to this point here, we're going to have pretty much no voltage there whatsoever, very, very low. If we read from ground to the cathode, we're going to have between 3 and 5 volts here, and then from ground to the plate, we're going to have 90 volts. And then what you would do is you would go from stage to stage to stage in the amplifier and looking for similar voltages. As long as you have a relatively high voltage on the plate here, you know that that stage is probably working at that point without using an oscilloscope, all right? So as you move along, you want to be checking this. If you found, say, uh, 25 volts here, you would know probably that either this resistor here is open or this capacitor is turning into a resistor. So in other words, it's leaky, okay? So if you put a positive voltage on the grid, it's going to turn this tube on really hard and it's going to pull the voltage down on the, on the plate. So you also have to keep in mind that the signal that's coming in here, all right, is inverted at this point. 
All right, so it's 180 degrees out of phase at this point. Reason being is because as the voltage is rising at this point here, okay, the voltage is going up. So basically what's happening is we're getting a positive grid voltage here. What this is doing is this is pulling, the tube is actually drawing load and it's pulling the voltage down at this point here on the plate. So as the voltage goes up on the grid, the voltage is coming down on the plate. So we get inversion going on. And that's part of the scheme, the way a phase inverter works. So the, the actual signal that's coming out of the cathode is in phase. The one that's on the plate is out of phase. Okay, so this and this will be the same. If it's a cathode follower, you know, there is no inversion. If it's the signal is coming out of the plate, there is inversion. So let's go take a look at this on the bench. I'll go try and find a 64 in my pile somewhere and throw some resistors together. And uh, we'll take a look at this and measure some voltages and see, and I'll demonstrate exactly how this amplifies and uh, how this works. I managed to find a 6C4 and I mimicked the exact circuit that was on the whiteboard with the addition of two 30K resistors so that I could show you how a phase inverter works. So right now I've got the 100K resistor selected to positive and I've got the 1.5K resistor selected to ground. Both 30Ks are just floating so they're just out of circuit. So again, it's pretty much exactly what was on the whiteboard. So you can see the two 30K resistors, they're not hooked up at all here, just floating. I've got a signal generator hooked to the input here and I've got the signal turned down. But what we're gonna do here is first take some voltage readings. So we'll take a look at the voltages here and you can take a look at the drops and it'll give you an idea of how this circuit would actually look if it was inside of an amplifier. These are the voltages that you would find in that amp, I should say. All right, so I'll turn on the 300 volt supply. It's around 300 volts. I didn't get too accurate with setting it. So keep an eye on the voltmeter there. I'll touch the 300 volt supply here. So 301 and, and a half, maybe a little bit more. This here is going through a 100K resistor and this is on the plate right now. So you can see the drop with the tube and circuit here. So about 85 volts at this point right here. So we'll take a reading of the cathode. 3.2 volts. And the grid will basically have nothing on it because the actual meter is referenced to ground. So I'll just touch this here. Now keep in mind that this tube is raised above ground by about 3.2 volts, so there is some bias on that grid. All right, so what I'll do is I'll turn up my signal generator over here a little bit, and I'll hook the scope probe up to the input, and we'll take a look at the amplitude on the input here. So you can see how small that is right now, 1.8 volts peak to peak. I haven't adjusted the scope just because it's gonna get pretty big when I put it on the other capacitor here. So I'll remove the scope probe, you can see it goes away, and I'll put it back on. So about 1.8 volts peak to peak at that point. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take that scope probe, remove it from here and put it to here, and this is the output. So we'll see how much this tube is actually amplifying. So we know we got about 1.8 volts peak to peak coming out of the signal generator. And now I'll put it on here. And if we look at the scope again, we now have 17.4 volts peak to peak. So we got quite a bit of amplification happening with this little tube here. And that again is at this point right here. So really what's happening here is we have a, a very small signal going into the grid of this tube and it's turning this tube on and off. When the tube turns on, it's basically pulling current through this 100K resistor and the voltage is dropping down here. So we have a, a drop in voltage, all right? And then as this is turning off, so the tube is letting go, all right, the voltage is going back up. So we're getting a ratio happening here. All right, so very little signal here creates a lot of swing at this point here. So the audio signal is going into the grid and the audio signal that's recreated at this point here is recreated from the rail. A lot of people don't seem to understand that one fact. So what's happening is, is 
This tube is pulling the rail down and letting the rail go again and pulling the rail down and letting it go again through this 100k resistor. So the voltage from this rail is actually making your audio signal at this point. The audio signal from this point is only turning this tube on and off. That's all it's doing. That's why it's so very important to have a well-filtered high voltage supply or this will act as a mixer and it will mix hum in this line here and you'll get hum over here as well. So all your audio signal is doing is turning the tube on and off and it's getting recreated by pulling this rail up and down and up and down and of course we're getting much higher amplitude at this point here. So next we'll take a look at the phase inverter and I'll show you exactly how that works. I have the phase inversion circuit hooked up now. So I've got this hooked up to a 350 volt supply right now just so we can see a little bit more difference. And I've got this here hooked to ground down here. So this meter that you see here is measuring from this point to ground. This meter you see here is measuring from the cathode to ground. I have a negative supply on the grid and I'm going to turn this supply more negative. So as I turn this more negative you're going to see this tube shut off more and this voltage is going to go up and you're going to see the voltage on the cathode go down because this is technically in phase with this. So if you wanted to look at this as a sine wave, as I'm turning the negative bias on here, so the voltage is going negative, you could look at this as going below the line as a sine wave, all right? So it's below the line. And as this is going up, you could look at this as going up above the sine wave. And basically you can see the inversion going on right there. So I'll turn the voltage here so start bringing it more negative and you'll see the difference and you'll understand why this is classified as a phase inverter. So here we go. So now I'm turning the voltage more negative. You can see that this is going down in voltage and this is going up in voltage. So now I'll bring this voltage more positive. That's going to turn this tube on more and it's going to draw current through this resistor causing the voltage to drop at this point. This voltage here is going to rise. You'll see this here in just a moment. So as this voltage is going down, you can picture this as a sine wave going down. And as this voltage is going up, you can picture this as a sine wave going up. And you can actually visualize how this phase inverter is working just by using DC coupling here. And that's really just how simple it is. Now you're seeing 330 volts here and 20 volts here and that's just because I'm reading from this point here to ground. If I was to be reading across this 30K resistor, it would be very close to this and the voltages would move in unison. Thanks for stopping by Tech Tips Tuesday. I'd like to end this video off by thanking a whole bunch of people, and I'll start with you, the subscribers. Thank you very much for being such a great group of people. I'd also like to thank a whole bunch of fellow video bloggers for the very kind mention in their videos. Thank you, Peter from the TRX Bench. Thank you, Tom from Antique Radio and TV. Thank you, Eric was a tonic. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Thank you, Buddy from the Radio Shop. Thank you, Joe or None. And I'd also like to thank George Graves and Brian Benchoff of Hackaday for putting some of my videos up there as well. Thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate it. This time, you guys get the thumbs up. See you next time.